<laughs> well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in this brand new series. Thanks so much to the organizers, Dorit Jordan Dotan and Judith Joseph, and also many thanks to Cheslin Amato, who is here, and Ghana uh, Wiesenthal Elias, who I don't think is here, and of course to the three presenters, and Dorit and Judith will introduce those. So, um, Dorit, Judith, take it away. All right, welcome to the third edition of the Jewish Arts and Open Studios online programs. We are so excited to be here again. This uh, program, next program will be next week, Tuesday, July 6th, it's noon Eastern time. Watch for emails from the Jewish Arts Salon with details. And I'd like to thank the, the Jewish Arts Salon, of course, and Yona uh, for this uh, opportunity to curate this amazing program. And of course, to Judith that co-curate co with me, and we had so much fun doing that. And yeah. Cheselina Meto, which help us a lot, and team member Hannah Elias. So uh, we put on the chat, uh, you put your questions on the chat, please, if you have. And we have all this information that we're not going to read now. So you can copy paste it from the chat. I hope everybody can see that. So if you want more information, the website of the artists, and if you like to contact them to buy some art, go ahead. The information is on the chat. All right. Thank you, Dorit. And yes, I'd like to repeat that it's such a great pleasure to work with you. I learned so much from you. And uh, thanks to Yona for supporting us and, and Jewish Art Salon and Hannah and Cheslin, of course. Um, I'd like to present our, our first artist today. Beth Krensky is a professor of art education and the area head of art teaching at the University of Utah. She is an artist, activist, and educator. She received her formal art training from the Boston Museum School. She is also a scholar in the area of youth-created art and social change. She received a master's degree with a focus on critical pedagogy and art education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and a PhD in education from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Now we're going to begin by showing you a film that Beth made. It's eight minutes long, so settle in and get comfortable and just get ready to um, take this in. And then we will uh, have an opportunity to talk with Beth about her beautiful film. You are my shepherd, I shall not want. You maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You leadeth me beside the still waters. You restoreth my soul. You guideth me in straight paths for your name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table 
before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in your house forever. Dearest children everywhere, thank you for being the harbingers of hope and teaching us to see the world anew through your eyes. The road is long and will continue far beyond this time of uncertainty. As your journey unfolds, may you walk in beauty, health, peace, and strength. May you always follow your true north. May you find shelter, safety, and sustenance. May you have the fortitude to weather the storms of life. When confronted with the rhetoric of hate, may you converse in the language of peace. In the struggle between fear and love, may you choose love. May your journey be long, and may it be filled with wonder and joy. Godspeed. Mother Earth, I sit here in the stillness amidst your exquisite beauty and give thanks beyond measure for your bounty. In the still of night, it is your heartbeat that I feel and your vast love that surrounds me. Thank you for holding me gently these many years. Thank you for the love of the trees and for the magic in my fingertips. I will carry with me the smell of sage from the desert at sunrise, the feel of heat waves rising up at the end of a hot summer day, the silence after a snowfall, the image of Orion shining down upon me out of the darkness, warm summer breezes carrying the salty taste of the ocean and the sweet aroma of fresh blossoms, the memory of birdsong. Your existence stretches long before and after this moment. You bear witness to hatred and wars, hardship, hunger, and pandemics, and you restore. Thank you for giving birth to the people who have risen to sustain, restore, and heal us. 
their very existence lies in the balance so that others may live. I recall their exhaustion and grace daily as I offer them a gratitude that I will hold forever. Protect them. Protect us all as we are called to protect you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I love it. Thank you, Beth. So if everybody, anybody and have some questions, Beth, you can. I actually do. I have some comments and questions for Beth. First of all, I want to apologize for the fact that the the Wi-Fi wasn't up to it. And it happens sometimes on Zoom. And I, I'm sorry that it was jerky. Um, I have put the, a link to the video in the chat. And I really encourage everybody to watch it again on your own time. But I think you got a, at least an idea of, at least the sound was really beautiful and full and perfect. You got an idea of what this was about. As I watched it, everything in my body just sort of relaxed. And I really felt that I entered a meditative state. And I think it was partly her voice, but it was the things that she was saying and the incredible visuals that were so beautiful that really took me to that place. So Beth, I'd like you to talk about the experience of making the video and how, what you, your thoughts are about that. Well, first of all, I just wanna thank you, Judith and Dorit for inviting me to be part of this. And a huge thank you to Yona for your longstanding deep commitment to the Jewish Arts Line. And thank you everyone for being here. So I guess, you know, in all work that I do and all things that I teach, I believe strongly in understanding who created the work, so the context, but in whose body, in whose voice, in what time and in what place. So I think for this piece, um, you know, you and I spoke earlier, Judith, about this meditation, this meditative space that you got in. I think my voice and my body became very important. So this was created in June 2020 almost a year to the date that I had surgery for thyroid cancer that left half of my throat paralyzed. So I actually spent five months without a voice and gasping for air, waking in the night, unable to breathe. And to this day, I still have sadly moments where for up to three minutes, I literally cannot breathe. Um, so I wanted, first of all, to, pre to, I don't know if I want a presence, but not hide my disability. And it occurred to me that this gasping for air at the time of COVID was what people experienced. And I lost my father to COVID and heard him gasping as he was talking to me. So I know that very frightening feeling. And just two days ago, I had it again. So that was part of it for me. My work is really about um, getting very essential and real with myself and hopefully creating an opening for others. So that breathing was real, any exertion, I start gasping like that. And my performances are truly um, authentic rituals for me. So for me, it was very meditative. I, those letters were written um, as I thought about this performance. It was about what must not left the uns but what, what can't I leave unsaid before I die if I were to die? Because I was pretty sure if I contracted COVID, I wouldn't live. So I went through a process of writing letters to people I loved. And I ultimately narrowed it down to those two letters for the final performance because I thought the very personal ones really detracted from um, the point. So it was intended as a meditation and Honestly, through the process of doing this performance, I no longer fear death because I, ha I had done the things that I needed to do that would make me feel 
comfortable if I were to die. So thanks, Judith. So your art practice really uh, was uh, a process of healing, which is something we talk about often, but, but you sort of moved through this traumatic life-threatening experience that you had with the help of your work it's incredible. I'd love for you to talk about the Jewish element of your work, because as I presented this in the artist Beit Midrash, people had all sorts of wonderful associations, um, and they really responded to the psalm, Psalm 23, which we hear at funerals. But actually, I'm realizing I'm working on a piece now with that as sort of the heart of it, and I think it, it was inspired by your film. So talk about how Judaism uh, plays a role in your work, please. Well, I think it's interesting that um, I'm, I grew up in Utah and left for 20 years, went to the museum school with Philip um, and, and returned to become a professor. So it was when I returned to Utah that my Jewish identity rose up to the forefront of much of my work. I would argue that it has been there throughout, but not so evident. So. I do a lot of research and, um, and then I create like makeup rituals. I actually study a lot of traditions of faith. Um, but for the, the 23rd Psalm, I was walking through um, a place called Emigration Canyon, which is at about 10,000 feet above sea level outside of Salt Lake City. And it is where Brigham Young came through the valley. So this idea of movement in and through something. So it's where the Mormon pioneers came. It's where before them, the Ute people lived and migrated and many others have come and gone. So the piece was metaphorically about walking through the valley of death and that hopefully we could walk out the other side. This idea of walking the unknown path actually comes, it doesn't matter where it comes from, but this idea that we make the road as we go and we don't know where we're going, right? But we have to just create that path. So clearly the 23rd Psalm, which has shown up in lots of my work. I actually had an entire exhibition that I didn't realize until the very end was the 23rd Psalm. I looked over and there was oil for anointing. And I looked another way and there was a table with bronze bowls I had made on it. And somewhere else there was a staff. And I mean, so it was pretty fascinating. So that piece, I've, um, I created this chair I burned the, the text into the chair and the chair is a school chair. So education has also been a, a longstanding strand um, throughout my life. And I would say is equally important to my identity as being an artist. Um, so there's that, but also this connection with nature. I mean, Judaism, ha like that is so core to, I, I believe, at least in my interpretation of Judaism and Jewish practice so it truly was a love letter to Mother Earth. And I think that is also the honoring of our tradition as well. But I, and I was going to comment on how I love how you bring in the love of the American West, which is so much about really um, a connection with the land in a, in a spe very special way. And I thought about all the hiking I've done in Arizona. It really came back to me in a very sensory way, even though this is in a slightly different place. But um, I, I, I love that I feel like my experience in the American landscape through your piece is sanctified and becomes a Jewish connection. And I think that's very special for us. We live in the diaspora, but you've, you've found a way to connect with nature in um, the American landscape in a very Jewish way. And I, I think that's wonderful. So I think... Um, Dorit is going to uh, bring us to our next artist. And I just want to thank you so much, Beth, for sharing that fabulous piece and sharing your thoughts about it. Thank, thank you, Beth. And if uh, anybody wants, we can later ask more questions uh, to Beth. So I will. This is Ellen Hubscheid. He's a Chicago artist working in, a, in painting and digital imaginary and comics. His subject matter ranges from landscapes and still life to images inspired by Jewish themes and texts. He developed a series of images based on biblical story of Jonah, investigating the nature of faith and faith. Another meditating on his conversation to Judaism. He exhibited his work widely. In addition, 
is trained cartographer and draftsman and teaches geography at Roosevelt University in Chicago. You can share your screen, Alan. Thank you. And you look wonderful, don't worry. It says uh, I'm disabled. Right a minute, just a minute, I make you a co-host. Right now. Beautiful. Thanks, dude. And you know how this works, Star 8. I just start talking and then you say stop, okay? Because, you know, I just go on and on. Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm Alan Hobscheid. You know, when you convert to Judaism, they train you up like for a year on the basics. So you get the Aleph Bet, uh, the Hagim, you go through the entire year of Hagim, how to be Shomer, uh, Kashrut, a little Torah, and it's great. But, you know, for me, when I got to be able to access uh, to more stuff, to deeper stuff, and that's when I got really turned on with the tradition that Judaism offers. You know, you get to the weird, cool stuff, wacky Midrashim, crazy discourses in Talmud, Kabbalah. Um, and, and that's how I met Leviathan, Leviathan in Hebrew. Uh, most of you probably are aware of, of what Leviathan is, but just quickly, a mythical sea creature, although not unique to Judaism, certainly, uh, in terms of sea monster mythologies, but definitely very deep roots in uh, Judaic lore and, and heritage. Uh, the image I have here on the, the PowerPoint is uh, William Blake's uh, image of Leviathan down at the bottom there, uh, resting on his back um, uh, from his uh, take on the book of Job. <clears throat> Partly my excitement with Leviathan too comes from growing up as a, a boy who was really into animals. I still am. I studied it voraciously. God knows why I didn't go into zoology instead of geography, but that's another story. And I drew animals constantly. So it was definitely this childlike wonderment that came out of me that made me totally obsessed on Leviathan. You know what else happens when you're a convert? Dorit, do you know? You get to choose your Hebrew name. Isn't that cool? So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, my name is Betzalel Yona. So Betzalel, uh, of course, identifying with the artist in the Torah and the Yona part. And this is just another cool, weird thing that I learned about Judaism is that there is this book of Jonah, so, say for Yona. And um, it's a, you know, if anyone's familiar with the story, certainly before I became a Jew, I had no idea, right? I just You just know that some dude got swallowed by a whale and that's all you know. But, you know, it's a story that goes all over the place and then it just ends. And it's, wow, that's crazy. But what's cool about it, what's pivotal, what's critical is that the protagonist's journey uh, ends up involving this fish, right? The dog, the hadag or the hadaga at different points in the, in the narrative. And of course, it ain't a whale, it is Leviathan, right? So. Leviathan plays a central role in, say, for Yona. And by the way, I probably read this story recently about this lobster fisherman guy who got swallowed by a whale. And, and thank God he's okay and everything, but we're not going to go there, okay? Just, just leave it out right now. Um, so um, I did a series of images, 12 images, kind of a meditation on, say, for Yona. Uh, using digital uh, Photoshop to create these uh, images. So I'll just show you those. Uh, right. can, you do, can you do a full screen, Alan? I think there is How a- How do you way. do that? I don't know, yeah. I'll do it like this. Does that help? Did that do yeah. something to you? Yeah? No, that's fine, I think. Cool. So uh, several of the images have Leviathan incorporated to it. Uh, and as you can see, I've, uh, I'm using uh, various images to uh, recreate the um, narrative of the story, in this case, the storm where, um, of course, Jonah is escaping uh, Israel and he is uh, caught up in the storm at sea. And I, I've incorporated Leviathan 
which is just a, a dried sturgeon that was at the Greek uh, grocery store. Um, excellent. It, you know, it was great, makes great soup, by the way, just, just a little tip there. Um, the next image is called the sleep. Jonah goes down into the, into the hold of the boat and, um, and uh, should I admit her? I'll admit her. And, um, and uh, again, have uh, Leviathan creeping around uh, in, the, in the murky depths around uh, Jonah while he sleeps in the hold during the storm. Uh, this is called the spit. And this is when, uh, after he's been swallowed by uh, Leviathan, he's uh, vomited out onto shore. Uh, and uh, this represents that point in the yeah, narrative. Can yes. Just, uh, talk a little bit about the medium. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, these are digital images working in Photoshop, and I'm I'm selecting uh, material from different sources, basically stealing images and uh, incorporating them. Um, uh, this happens to be. I think she's on right now. Are you on, Hannah? Yeah. This is my daughter, uh, who who was my my model for this. Uh, so um, I had her. Uh, in, in a couple, in fact, almost all my family members were used in this to some degree. Uh, and this is called the fish. And this is, it's hard to see, um, but on purpose. But Yona uh, sitting uh, at peace inside of uh, Leviathan. And I'm here using a uh, whale, a whale bone actually, uh, the rib cage of a whale uh, to uh, uh, exemplify his experience inside the whale, inside Leviathan. So, oh, so I'll just keep going here. So the, uh, another weird Jewish thing that you can get into, of course, is Sefer Eov, uh, the story of Job, All right? And again, if you're familiar with Job, uh, Leviathan, again, occupies a crucial, central role in the telling of the story. And it happens near the end of, of Job. Uh, by the way, for reference, I, I use uh, Stephen Mitchell's um, translation, Book of Job. I recommend this as opposed to reading it from Tanakh. He kind of gets right down to the, um, he gets rid of a lot of editing and unnecessary language that got added in over the years. So it's, it's, it's more poetic, I would say. And certainly the section towards the end, chap chapter 40, that focuses on God after Job has gone through all of his travails, the arguments, the confusion, the anger, uh, the despair, God sits down with him and tells him what is creation all about and what's your role in that. And how does he portray that? Through Leviathan. He says, here, I'm gonna talk to you about a sea monster and you're gonna understand what this is all about. And he goes on, God goes on and on about how, uh, how strong Leviathan is, how beautiful he is, how unassailable, you can't kill him, you can't hurt him. And so from, those, uh, from that imagery in the poem, I did a series of paintings. These are oil on paper uh, attached to a panel. And uh, this one's called the harpoon. Uh, and these are taken from uh, verses in chapter 40. Uh, so uh, here, you know, he's, uh, God says, you know, harpoons can't pierce his skull and things like that. Um, this one's called the spear. Uh, on the left, you see the full painting. It's about 20 by 48. Uh, again, oil and paper. And then uh, on the right is a detail at the bottom there uh, of Leviathan just chilling out in the, in the murky depths, un, just doesn't care about these spears coming at him. Humans can try to do whatever they want and it's gonna be useless, okay? And that's the message that Job gets. And at the end of God's telling about Leviathan, Job is at peace, he gets it. And he goes back to his old life and reaps dividends, actually has a better life if you into, um, into you know uh, personal wealth and and goods and whatnot, but you know it's it's this crucial idea that Leviathan is 
is pivotal to understanding God's creation that drives the, the narrative in Yonah. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, in Eov. Uh, this last image is um, called the wake, and it just talks about how uh, Leviathan's tail is so strong that it just whips up the ocean into this frothy, uh, glistening, uh, beautiful wake in its in its path. So um, the um, Jonah and Job certainly are critical texts uh, to understand Leviathan. But I want to introduce two proof texts here to share with you. The first is from Job. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, he is the first of the works of God created to be my plaything. So this is from chapter 40, where he's going on and on about, about Leviathan. So who reshit archeel, right? He is, of all the things he's creating in the world, what's the first thing he's gonna do? He's gonna create a sea monster. He's gonna create Leviathan. And why does he create Leviathan? To play with it. Okay, so let's set that right there. And that's one of the proof texts. Um, and the other one is from Psalm 104. So uh, here ships go to and fro, and they're describing the ocean here, and Leviathan that you formed as your plaything. So again, this idea of Leviathan being created to be God's plaything. What are we going at here? So the, this Psalm 104, how many of you are familiar with it? Raise your hands. Is uh, basically a primer on creation, on God's creation. It's, it's basically saying, this is how the world works, people. God winds up a little toy, let's go, right? And here we are, we have this little presence in this creation, significant though, but still we're part of these much, much larger cycles that drive everything on the planet. And for our context today, most importantly, this Psalm is read on Rosh Hodesh. For every Rosh Hodesh, we read Psalm 104. Let me let Bonnie back in. And so um, the new moon, the new month, a new beginning, an opportunity to reset, to start over is built into this psalm. And what is key to this series? It's about regenesis. It's about rebeginning. And both of these passages are referring to a sea monster. And what's the idea here? Leviathan was created to be God's BFF, right? When God needs to chill out, to relax, to just be God's self, get some quality time, what does he do? He goes and plays with Leviathan. He doesn't care about humans or anything else. This is his go-to right here. This is where he needs to be to get level set, to get back into a good frame of mind. Fantastic. And it's professional and it's amazing. I love it. <laughs> we have you a minute to, to close it up so we can- Yeah, I will. And uh, I'm almost there. So, um, so what's interesting, the word for play, the play thing here, this sin chet kuf, right? It, the, the word uh, means, it, go, it goes around laughing, like Yitzhak comes from that, uh, Sarah laughing. Uh, and then it's about amusement uh, and about play and about sport. And in, in English parlance, we can say recreation, right? This is recreation for God. But the word recreation is re- create, re-genesis, re, re breshit right? We have an opportunity to re-energize ourselves, to reinvent ourselves, to change and to grow. And so God is setting Leviathan in front of humans for us to model, to understand what God's self is about and that we can emulate this and understand that creation is something that humans need to be in sync with, to be a part of, and not to be uh, uh, opposite to or working against somehow. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Dorit and Judith, for the opportunity to go on and on about this stuff. Fantastic. <laughs> it's great. Well, I just want to say that that was a very beautiful presentation, Ellen, and 
I was fascinated by your interpretation of, of Jonah and your paintings are just beautiful. Let's, let's move on to our, our last artist today, Beth Haber. Um, she is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, and designer living in the Hudson Valley of New York. Her inst installations have been exhibited widely. Her two-dimensional work is found in museum, university, and private collections, both in the US and internationally. She's been a member of the education staff at DIA, DIA? DIA Art Foundation since 2009. Yeah. Um, so please unmute Beth, and we're, we're doing this a little more informally than we did the last session. Beth, I'm going to start with the three um, pieces that you sent in for um, the Regenesis submission, and then we'll move on to your website. So I'm going to share my screen and show those pieces, and we'll love to hear you talk about them. Great, great. So um, I, first of all, I want to compliment and thank you uh, Judith and Marit and the whole team that put together the um, this question of the title of this this show this flood after the flood regenesis because it was so evocative and interesting and um, because for me and I, I see that there's some sort of a blue line um, in in both presentations in terms of where language is and then. This place where I work, language can be out there, it can be submerged uh, and or it can be uh, just temporarily submerged. So uh, the first piece um, of the, the okay, so yeah, I'll work with this one, remainders. But what I wanted to say is as I started to kind of explore the concept here and where my work fits, fits with this, was this no, I, notion of, of flow and, and water. And we have been so flooded. We have been flooded with grief this year. We've been flooded with all kinds of crises. Um, how, do, how do you rebuild? We don't start with a clean slate. None of us are gonna start with a clean slate. So what, what are the things that we need to recall, remember to move forward? Uh, what I fell into and um, for years, I used to draw on uh, Bachelard Gaston, Bachelard's Poetics of Space, but I came across this wonderful essay he wrote called Water and Dreams, an essay on imagination of matter, in which he says that language is liquidity. Beth, can you mention the name of the author mm -hmm. again? I missed it. Yeah, Gaston Bachelard. So it's a Thank French uh, writer, um, very um, active in the academic world in the 80s. Um, it's no longer alive, but he did a series on um, matter and from the, the, the different elements. And his one on, on water is called Imagination, Matter, Water, and Dreams. So that really kind of... Um, Opened, opened something up for me with that. The, um, the other thing is the, that James Hillman, who's a tutu, James Hillman, who, is, who, who writes about psychology and image, said that, um, and your reflection type of thinking that it, you're urged to do, and reflection is a water term. And he claims, and this goes right to what Alan was, was referring to, that uh, what matters is the syllable re, R-E. And its most important syllable in psychology is reverie, its reverberations, its return, and its regenesis. So all of that kind of played into some of this work. But let me mention what's on the screen. The first image I think you showed was pitching a tent on the fourth day, which was pretty much um, thinking about creation and recreation and the um, indeterminate space between um, land and sea. So um, the tents, it's really hard to discern that they uh, where are they? Are they in the water? Are they on the land? The, um, there's a, a plinth that has a little 
little bit of a whale form in it and see and they're very ghost-like they're um, in the seabed is called so this is this is from a series that i did um in venice in the conoregio of the uh, scuola canton which is one of the synagogues and um the images i mean venice is the merging of of, uh, matter and water and imagination uh, but in the synagogue, this is the uh, floral pattern is actually the screen of the women's gallery. So not only are the women, you know, they're above the wall there, but above in, and, and that is an elaboration of the form, but it's done in a series of Fibonacci. So the petals are eight petaled images and the material and all of the material that I've showed on this work so far is using uh, mylar, which is a resistant, non-absorbent material. So what is water is tracery or about evaporation that clings to it. And it's interesting. It's a gorgeous surface and it reminds me of the kinds of um, kind of the mold growing and and the marks that are made on the walls of the buildings of Venice. And you capture the colors and the textures of it just beautifully. It's so interesting that something so organic would work beautifully on mylar, which is the most plastic and modern <laughs> surface. So um, well done on that. Are, are you ready then to proceed to the website? Can we go to those images now, Beth? Absolutely. So are we looking at some of the, uh, the Moby Dick? Exactly. We're going to look at the Moby Dick. Okay. So this is where we talk about um, the submerged text because these are layered, built up so that they are scanned, um, magnif scanned from a small edition of 1916. Absolutely. Yeah. So this, this is it has elements from the narrative um, of. Uh, which is the you know the whale uh, with the kind of the barnacles and the texture, and also the tattooing that is part of the story that happens in Moby Dick, and the fish bones that kind of uh, connect the spine that act as um, kind of uh, parts of your your grammar. They're 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 kind of quoting. So yes, and that is the, on the mylar is a, um, that stone effect is mica that's in the pigment. So what, what is the size so, yeah, of those pages, Beth? So those are, um, each, each, they're around uh, 30 inches by uh, 40 inches. Uh, so they're, like if you opened your hands, it would be kind of to the width of a large reed so that you can be submerged in the in the text. I mean, it's this, uh, it's, you know, for, for those familiar with Moby Dick, it's an ocean that you go into and it's an ocean of words. And I, what I have done is a series and it's ongoing based on different chapters. Um, so this particular, this particular chapter is the counterpane. Uh, and it is this kind of connection between cultures. There's also the sunken ship, the boat. And, and these are the elements because the book of Jonah, he incorporated, Melville leaves nothing out. And the book of Jonah is incorporated into the text as well. And uh, this is a scan of an image of a 2000 year old ship that was found on the bottom of the Bosphorus, which um, I really loved the structure of it where you could really see it, but it really almost becomes a fish in itself. There's I have a question um, about this, something... Beth, pardon me for interrupting, but it looks like it's bound like a book, but it also looks like these pieces are each wall pieces. Are they all bound together or are they separate pieces? This this is one piece. Each piece is a book. It's got a, th a third dimension to it. So it's maybe three and a half inches in depth because there's some swell. There's a okay. swell of an open book. 
but there's no intention. You don't have to turn the page to see the next work. They're each separate. Is that right? Yeah. Each one is contained, right? So you okay. can't, um, in other words, you can see where the text is there and not there. It is somewhat the text, and some of it you can discern, but it, it really is what has kind of come out visually from the text for me. So like it is what I'm playing with is the idea that it's a foundational text and it's underneath. Got it. So uh, okay, so I see the the common elements between these is the the way you present them, the way you bind them the way the text peeks through from underneath, which is such a beautiful way to um, express the experience we have as we read, because the text enters our mind, we kind of digest it, but it, concurrently we have visual images that play along. And I've never seen that expressed just quite so beautifully as you've done it here. Yeah, thank, thank you. So yes, and the counterpane, if, if, if you know the story and, and, and forgive me for, for <laughs> No, you know, I'm, I've been so immersed in, in Moby Dick for a number of years, and especially I had a solo show um, on part of the series uh, right after the election in 2016. And in reading Moby Dick, it took on a completely other form. The fact that there, the, the world that's inside of that book, it was the white whale for Melville was the whiteness in this country, which was gonna stove and destroy the country. He wrote this in 1851, knowing the civil war was on its way. And it's like a precursor to that. And so the, the you know, it, it, people that see um, the biblical references from Moby Dick as that kind of a place that you can keep going in and, and finding something that feels very present. So when you say whiteness, you're saying that he had a he had a feeling that the obsession with white race was going to be destructive. Is that what you're saying? I mean, if you notice in, in this one or in other ones that I've done where there are tattooing, he um, has a relationship on the crew. The crew is a very mixed international crew and they go all the way. They're going all the way to the east for the, the whale, this whaling. And he is... Um, at the counterpane is a blanket, and it's a blanket he shares at the inn before he starts with a Maori tribesman named Kwikwig that they become friends. And so there's there's this tattooing, there's exotica, there's the the bones, there, there's the fish bones. It's it's in the story, but it's it's larger than than just just the text. But I do have a, a, a couple on whiteness, the whiteness, because he has a whole chapter on whiteness. And what it means as a color, and what it means um, on surface, and it's both uh, prized and and frightening to people. It's fascinating um, so to put it in the contemporary context, you know, um, the way you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, there. If I don't know if you scroll down a couple, there's a few on on whiteness. Um, there's there's a whiteness image, right? There there's one. So the, the, the um, conglomerate, the calcification on the, the whiteness is an overlay on the shells that are underneath and they become kind of a vocabulary of their own. And um, that one is the chowder. So there's, it, they, I, I use them as kind of a, a, a language too, but they're, they're, the color is there too. And the whiteness is an, is an overlay on the color. Are those the watercolor there? They are acrylic primarily. I also use some oil stick when I want a particular sheen for the surface that has that water feel. But the, um, the, the elements that are in it are, are mostly, uh, yeah, most, mostly acrylic. And then also sand mixed media pieces where I take an image and put it on a transparency. Um, and add it, add it to it. But these are actually, the, these particular ones, the shells are the vocabulary of this conglomerate, conglomeration. I'm gonna scan um, back up because I didn't realize that you weren't seeing this view and I apologize for that. Um, but I want everyone to see the, <clears throat> the tattooing images and the other Moby Dick images that you were talking about. The counterpane. 
counterpane and the ship and yeah they're so rich mm. they really are uh and i love the gold i talk about that the choice to use is it gold leaf or gold paint or both well the gold the gold actually um is part of the um kind of an oriental the, as 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 the voyage goes towards Japan, which is where where basically that's where the the, the ship is destroyed by the by the whale. So that's the you know you you're getting the loomings of the journey and where it's going to go. Um, they're on a doomed ship, really, right? It's um, uh, but there are there's this beauty in these other cultures, and you're they're, you're going into the east. You're going. You know, he's dealing with first. He's horrified by the tattooing, and then he starts to um, find, you know, that that everyone everyone comes into the world and offers something different. And there's that um, broadness in in the text that is, um, you know, very, very, feels contemporary and important. Um, yeah. It, yeah, I just, the sense of time in this, it's timeless, and it has a biblical resonance, but it, it's so contemporary and so beautiful. Um, we're kind of coming up on the hour, so I'm going to um, invite people to um, interact with you and comment. Um, I see uh, some comments in the chat from Cheslin. Uh, Cheslin writes, I so appreciate your repertory of images and ideas. Gaston Bachelard and Herman Melville are also voices that have been important to me. Uh, I feel that Moby Dick is one of the most amazing and important literary works. Thank you for your poetics of image and word. Um, I think it's so interesting to consider these three artists and the way their, their works sort of um, overlap in terms of ideas, but yet are so unique. So um, Beth, did you have any final words that you want to share with us or thoughts? I see that someone asked what a counterpane is. So a counterpane um, is an old word for a quilt or a blanket. And, um, and it's pat usually it's, pa it's patched. So it's made of different, like what a crazy quilt might be, although, although a little less crazy. It's more, it has more of squares. And so, I mean, uh, the shape was important to me, the patchwork was important to me, and then the bits of sea that um, portend where they're going is, is important to me. But it was also the fact that he had to share this blanket in the inn um, with this, uh, who he thought was a savage, who became really a, a really important person in his life, who he admired. Um, he was full of tattoos, which was um, not the usual, it's not the usual presentation that a, a New England guy was used to, right? Um, but the ship, the ship, uh, other than um, Ahab, who is the depiction of a demagogue and is really treated that way in, in the book. So, so it really feels that there's, that it's a very present book. I think it's interesting mm -hmm. to think about the kind of central images today of the ship, the fish, and the chair. And those are the, the things that I'm going to take away. This so Dorit, good. would you like to give us our reminder about what's upcoming? Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for participating. I think uh, for after the flood regenesis, it was perfect. I really felt that. And I hope we're all going to continue going this way. And I'd love to have you all here. Next session is going to be on July 6th. It's going to be Tuesday, but later after that, we're going to move back to Sundays. Um, and I hope to see you all coming to the sessions. And so I hope you all enjoyed and you're going to see you next time. We'll see you next time.